Hello, friends, and welcome to Thursday's edition of the Kings of Anglia podcast. I hope you're having a good week so far. Today is going to be part two of the debate we started on Monday. We did out of contracts players on Monday. Today, we're going to get into the loan player debate. I'm Mark Heath. Joining me just to do that today, the two best kings, let's be honest, Dr. Stuart Watson and Andy Hutch Hogan, Hutchzilla, Michael Hutchins. I'll leave it there. Warren. I don't know where I stand with you, mate. I don't know where I am. I don't know what you want from me. I don't know where I stand. Sometimes you told me I was the worst king on <laughs> on Monday. Did I? You I can't remember that. You, yeah, you, yeah, I remember. You messaged me privately on Tuesday to say that I was your favourite, and now I'm joint favourite with Stu. I, I don't know where. I, I don't know. I didn't say you were joint favourite. I said you were the best. You, you, well, it just confused me even more. Doesn't mean you're my favourite. I can just respect you as a man and a journalist. But you don't like me. That's fine. Well, um, very confused. Very, okay. very confused. I like to keep. I, I like to keep the team on the edge, like a, a Brian Clough esque figure at the top. Um, when I give you praise, it's sincere, mostly. Uh, anyway, friends, let's dive in to the show. Um, and what I assume you're okay before we kick off. Always, always okay. Both both of us clad today in Under Armour gear. So if Under Armour are listening, we're always available to new sponsors. I very much enjoy your clubber. Um, so I wouldn't mind a little uh, sponsorship deal. We, we're both wearing it today. Um, friends, before we get into the meat of the show, the lone players debate, we have to touch on things that have happened since we last spoke. First of all, uh, as part of Monday's show, we debated son, sorry, Shawnee Aluko, um, uh, whether or not he should be given a new contract. And since then, indeed, I think it was the following day, it emerged that he had indeed triggered as part of his contract, a new deal by meeting a, a, a kind of appearance, number of appearances. Um, now, when I went back and listened to the show, boys, as I did when I was driving to, to North Norfolk uh, on Tuesday, it occurred to me there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of rancor and disagreement on that show. You were pretty much just agreeing with each other about everything. Um, but Aluko is one of the ones you actually did disagree with. Stewie and, and Roscoe both said yes. Hutchie, you said reluctantly no because you didn't think he was going to play enough and, and suggested maybe he'd go into the uh, the coaching side of things. But now it has actually happened. How do we feel about it? I'm going to start with you, Hutchie, because you didn't want him at the club. Um. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Kick him out. Is, I exactly. Believe, I believe is, is the word that I used. You wanted him out. Um, so he's now in, Hutchie. How does that make you feel? I feel exactly the same about it as I did on Monday. I think he's a great influence. I think I've enjoyed watching him play. Um and I still think there's he's got a role role to play, but I, I still think I still think he might play less next season than he has this season. Um, mm. But I think that uh, like he's clearly a positive influence a, around the team and clearly a, a good football player. So if he's if he's here for next season, um, that's a, that's a good thing. But I, I still think they'll recruit in his position. Mm. Stewie, you very much wanted him here for reasons discussed on Monday. He will be here. Does that make you feel warm and, and cuddly inside? Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased that he's, he's staying. Of, um, of course, for the reasons that sort of outlined in in the previous podcast. But I think um, is he is he going to start every week? And is he going to be the man that kind of drives Ipswich to a promotion push next season? Arguably not. I think he's he's got a role to play within the squad. Um, don't underestimate that in terms of the off-field qualities and, and the influence he can have on some of the younger players coming through. But I'm not sure he's going to be a week-in, week-out starter. We've discussed maybe the the shortage of, of goals and assists from him in the position that he plays. Um, and I think Andy's right. They will look to recruit across that that top end of the team, not just the central strikers, but the, the men in behind as well. Um, obviously, Bursant Selina is, is one of the players in, in that position um and we're about to talk about the lone players in a bit so um we can have that discussion mm. just a couple of other things to kind of tick off the list before we get to that loan debate um today we should mention is the 60th anniversary it's thursday the 28th of april the 60th anniversary of Ipswich town rocking the football world and changing the face of football by lifting the first division title under sir ralph ramsey or just alf as he was then um, a tremendous achievement. I've done something which is online this morning. Go and read it. Kind of a a little look back, a little peek behind the curtain, and a little bit of a how it happened. 
as well as to what happened um, because it is a truly, truly remarkable story. Um, we look at Leicester City and we look at Nottingham Forest, um, but before them, Ipswich Town doing that. Clearly, long before we were alive, Hutchie, um, we, we, we young and vibrant and thrusting. Um, but <laughs> what, what a story. What a story it was. I mean, imagine covering that back then when Ipswich Town were champions of England. Yeah, a bit different to what we're doing now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw someone, changed. yeah, thrusting. <laughs> now, my life my life is a th one big thrust. Um, yeah. I saw someone describe it this morning in, in quite nice terms this morning, just just, just kind of outlining what had happened. They said that Born is, is the equivalent of Bournemouth winning promotion under Eddie Howe, winning the Premier League the following season, and then four years after that, Eddie Howe winning the World Cup with England, <laughs> which... Obviously, we're talking about 60 years ago. Football was very, very different, but a slightly more. If that happened today, that would have been that would have been what happened. Promotion for Bournemouth, win the league the following year, and then the manager goes off and wins the World Cup for England four years after that. And um, just because it was 60 years ago doesn't, you know, maybe it's easy to kind of just think, ah, football was different then. But yeah. it's still a pretty, pretty remarkable achievement, isn't it? I mean, it was definitely different. And throwing to that particular analogy, Eddie Howe coming up with tactics which revolutionised the game and turned the game on its head, uh, which is what, what Sir Alf did. And of course, back then, before um, everyone watching every game and social media and all that kind of stuff, you could do things like that and it would still take people by surprise. Um, and it, it kind of then became the foundation on which Sir Alf led England to World Club glory. Um, Stewie, I know you've spoken to various people over the years, indeed, I included some quotes from your, your interviews with Andy Nelson and, and Ray Crawford, who I think could probably still do a job uh, on the football pitch. He is extremely sprightly, even as an 80 plus year old. Um, your thoughts on that remarkable story? You would have loved to be penning stuff around that, wouldn't you, back then? I'm not sure Ray Crawford could do a job now <laughs> at, at 85, 86. I think I did a piece in 2016. I did a piece with him when he turned 80. I'll tell you what, hmm. mentally he'd still be able to do it. Ray Crawford is, uh, I think he could, he scored hundreds of goals and I think he could recount every single one of them to you in, in detail. He's uh, He's got remarkable memory for for all of the, all of the details of the games and everything. Um wasn't that long ago he was still doing sort of co-commentary down down in Portsmouth which is his mm. part of the world um to continue that Bournemouth analogy with Eddie Howe not only would would that have all happened but Bournemouth would have done it with five of the players that they'd have had in the equivalent of League Two um all the way is it League Two that would have been Division Three South so yeah League, league one, Two, two three, yeah so um five of the players went all the way through through the levels and then became top division top tier champions which is mm. which is remarkable really i know around the time of leicester winning the league we we did a lot on sort of everyone sort of saying this is the this is the biggest fair football fairy tale ever um arguably ipswich's was was even better considering mm. where they came from i know it's different times and the money's changed and everything else Take nothing away from it. I know it feel it's like a, a bygone era. It's black and white. It doesn't doesn't feel real to sort of people of a of mm. a certain age. But it happened, and it's a, a remarkable achievement that Ipswich should should be very very proud of. Putting that together, I was reminded you often get refer you, you hear kind of um, progressive thinking managers players being ahead of their time, and certainly Sir Ralph was ahead of his time in in what he was doing and recruitment and tactics. But in terms of media, he was very much a man of his time there was no i'm not sure how sir alf would have coped today with with kind of sound bites and interviews because there's a great interview literally he's just won the first division title and the man from the bbc says oh tremendous and so uh, how do you feel sir alf or alf as he was then uh, and he just goes i feel fine <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really good impression. Yeah, well, that's how they all—that's how they all spoke, wasn't it? Everyone spoke like that on the BBC, and and, and Alf did as well. I feel fine. I'm delighted. Um, and then went on to the guy kind of said, "What well, a tremendous thing you've done for football. No one expected you to do this." Blah, 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 blah. And um, and then he goes on to say, "Well, yes. Uh, when I, when one looks at it, we've done a a wonderful thing for football, and I mean we because I can't do it alone." He sounds a lot like Prince Charles actually in this impression. Um. <laughs> And he goes on to say, I, I like to think I work hard, but the players work, going. Work, equally, going, work equally as hard. 
uh, and that was it. And the great the great story from Tony Garnett, uh, my predecessor as as um, sports editor at the Anglian and, and a legend. Um, Tony is also of that kind of ilk in terms of uh, privately school educated and like kind of. So anyway, there's a great story. So Sir Alf is is not at all really moved by the fact he's just done this remarkable thing. Doesn't really give any kind of dramatic sound bites as discussed and imitated. But then when everyone's gone home, he asked Mr. John, famously the, the chairman of Ipswich Town, to take his seat in the director's box. And this, this is the detail I love most. Sir Alf letting his hair down, the nutter, he takes his jacket off. He takes his jacket off, boys, and does a solo kind of lap of honour around Portman Road just for Mr. John without his jacket. I bet he was still wearing a tie. Um, and, and that's that's how they did things back then. So it's all in all, it's a, it's a wonderful story. Like I say, I've written a piece, go and read it. Uh, and also Rossi's done an interview with a, with a fan who was there that season, watched a lot of the games. K-Way Retro recording it. Um, and that should be available to watch and consume as I well. Liked the, um, I like the anecdote, I think Ray told me on that aforementioned 80th birthday interview where he talked about, and you included this in the piece online today, about Kenneth Wollstenholme. Yeah. The famous, um, they think it's all over, commentator, of course, from 66, who um, was one of Ipswich's sort of biggest doubters of, of that period. And I think uh, famously sort of midway through that season said that if Ipswich were to to go on and secure the, the first division title, uh, unlike Gary Lineker offering to do match of the day in his in his pants, his, uh, he said he'd buy a dozen bottles of champagne for the for the team um, and was, was true to his word at the end of the season. So different times but I, I like that anecdote it's a nice one altogether more refined and civilized back then wasn't it i say chaps here's your champers enjoy it cheers um maybe i should do the whole show in that i, I think I'm you not. absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> right then boys before we go on to loans one more thing to tick off that's happened before we last spoke the awards do end of season awards awards award shows generally not really our thing but obviously they're, they're a thing in football ipswich town have had theirs Stewie, do you want to bring us up to speed on who won? Not not many surprises, but I guess we should mention it just before we move on. Two more awards for Wes Burns, who was obviously named in League One Team of the Season um, at the EFL Awards last Sunday. Fresh from that on Tuesday night, was it, at um, Milsom's Kesgrave? Um, he is Players' Player of the Season, which is the one, I think, out of all the awards that the players probably will, will take the most pleasure from if you're getting a nod from your peers that have watched you and played alongside you all year. He got that one. He got Sponsors Player of the Year as well. So could well end up with with the full set. With uh, There's every chance he'll win uh, Fans Player of the Year as well, which is yet to be announced. Um, no surprises, Burr St. Selina gets goal of the season for the uh, for the chip against Crew. Um, and they were the main ones, really. I think Connor Chaplin got uh, something for sort of his uh, community work throughout the course of the season uh, and plenty of awards handed out um, for the women's side of things as well. So um looked like it was a decent night on uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, just the old dot the I's and cut the T's there, Stu. Kyra Robertson, women's player, player of the season. Bonnie Horwood, supporters player of the season. And Natasha Thomas, sponsors player of the season. I'm sure Stu um, Stewie... Roscoe, who's not with us today because he's a very busy boy today, um, he recorded a, a Tractor Girls talk, which I think is out there now, which I'm sure we'll be talking about those kind of things. Right then, friends, let's move on, without further ado and silly impressions, to the big lone players debate. Hutchie, this is a masterstroke, like Sir Ralph tucking his wingers inside all those years ago, um, suggesting that we keep this for Thursday's show. And I'm pleased we did, because now we can properly have a debate about it. Now, I think this is more interesting than the out-of-contract debate, I've got to be honest. And also, as I say, I'm hoping there's going to be slightly more rancor and disagreement and perhaps bad blood between the two of you as we start to uh, discuss this. Um, because there's, there's obviously there's four guys. I think on all but one of them, I'm hoping we're going to have disagreements. And if you don't, I'm just going to kick in, boys. I'm going to play devil's avocado and try and try and provoke stuff. So there's obviously there's four players. I want to do it in a very set order because I think that there's one player that you're pretty much going to agree on um, who's probably time at Ipswich Town is coming to an end and he won't be back. So let's start first of all, if you don't mind boys, with the kind of, I guess the highest profile you would say, certainly um, in terms of his status in the game and ability on the pitch, I guess. Bersant Salina um, back for a second do-round at Portman Road this season. Unbelievable, we thought when he came back. 
Um, and he said he'd quite like to stay, which again is, is remarkable. What do we think about Burst and Selena? I'm going to start with you, Hutchie. Should Ipswich Town try and sign Burst and Selena? We've spoken before. You think it's realistic they could. One imagines it would take a fair chunk of change to get him here permanently. Or should they just say, thanks thanks for thanks for playing for us, Burson. Off you go back to Dijon. Maybe our, our, our pass will cross somewhere down the line. What, what would you do with Burson and Salina? Show you're working. I'd like I'd like them to sign him. Um, and I do think it's realistic. And you're right, it will take a, take a bit of work. Uh, it could be another loan. Um, that might be the easiest way to to get him back here it might be something full time but i'd i'd like i'd like to see him back here there's a discussion to have obviously about about whether he's lived up to what we expected from him um i would say i would say i expected more from him but mm. at the same time there are reasons why i would understand why that's not quite happened and there uh, and there are things that he can improve on and the team can improve on to make use of him but for the moments that he delivers and the things that he's capable of, I would really, I would really like them to sign him, to sign him one way or another. Okay. Before we get to Stu's, Stu's thoughts, we asked the Koei Army last night to vote on a, a series of polls about these players and also offer their thoughts on them. And, and Selena, in terms of the poll, got the most votes and has inspired the most comment, really. So almost 700 votes on this poll, um, 82% of the Koei Army saying, Let's try and sign Bursant Salina. But a real mixture in the comments. Um, I'll just read a, a few out. Marty Dye, our old friend, says, We all love Salina, but I think I'd send him back because I don't think he's done enough. Question mark. He says, I'm doing a stew and asking myself a question here. Um, Steve says, I think Salina has been a better player under, under McKenna. He's got what it takes to unlock defences, and we're going to need that. Um, take a few more. Um, Kai says everyone wants Selena to stay and everyone knows about the money side of things it's been said by everyone if there are cheaper options however I wouldn't be opposed to sending him back and just finally Rob says really unsure on Selena he's not quite done it what I thought he would uh, and I know he's got had issues with his health I originally just wonder if he's really suited to League One football maybe he's a player that looks better further up the pyramid um, I'm going to say what I think before I bring you in Stu because you're the big dog I think He's a bit of a luxury. He's going to take he's going to take quite a lot of money. Maybe the the highest paid player at the club. He does disappear in games. You look at his stats this season. I think he's got six goals, some tremendous goals clearly, and and three or four assists. So not massive numbers in terms of productivity. And I just wonder if Town can afford to be spending out. I know they've got money, but a big chunk of change on a player who will be brilliant one week and then will vanish for two or three games. Um, in terms of a a promotion push next season. That would be that would be my thinking. So I'm saying no. Hutchie's saying yes. Stewie, what are you saying? I, I think you're both a joke and I disagree with both <laughs> yes, of you completely. Um, I can't disagree with both of you, can I? Because you both no. said different things. That was just a joke. <laughs> um, I would love to see Burst and Selena back. I think his qualities outweigh some of the deficiencies, um, six goals, five assists. He's not been playing week in, week out. If you look at the chances created as well, it's just having a look at the BBC do it. If you look at sort of, if you look up League One top scorers and go to Ipswich, it will it'll give you a breakdown of chances created and things like that. Twenty uh, sorry, forty nine chances created. He's he's the one that can produce that bit of magic and unlock the door. And uh, and I think with a better left-sided player alongside him, if you could get some sort of relationship going in the same way that Danassian and Burns have, have hit it off, I think that's not helped that Burst and Selina works in those sort of inside left channels and he's not necessarily had a, a left-sider or people to kind of uh, be on his same wavelength. I'd love to see him back, but it comes with, with a caveat. It comes with an asterisk that it has to be it can't completely break the bank if it's like he is the, you know, it takes up a significant part of the budget and that prevents you being able to level up in other positions like striker, for example, which is where the big bucks go. It has to be for the right price. And I, and I think ultimately 
I think it will end up with him coming back on loan. I can see another Daryl Murphy situation where Ipswich keep getting him back on loan next year, maybe even the year after. I think his contract has still got a fair bit of time to run at Dijon. I've just had a little look at the uh, the League 2 table in France. Dijon are sitting 13th. They're not going to be able to afford to keep keep him there. They had to get him off the wage bill following relegation. And has Bursant Selina done enough this season to have championship clubs falling over themselves to, to get him back? Maybe, maybe not. He, he's What he's done in the past and for Swansea and may see a club like, I don't know, Luton or someone like that that might go for him, someone that's kind of go for him in the championship. Then Bursant Selina, does he want to go there to go back to the championship or would he rather be at Ipswich where he's made it clear that he, he, he feels loved and wanted here and, and would feel like he's got a chance of of winning something and doing things here at this football club. I think Ipswich can get this deal done and uh, I think he'll oh, he'll be back here on loan next season would, would be my guess. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm. If you look at if you look at Dijon, Stu, almost their entire squad that was relegated from League A was loaned out in similar in similar fashion. They've got so many players out on loan, either up pyramids or to other to other countries. Uh, they they've got a squad that I don't think they can carry in the division that they're in. Um, and I think let, let's use Luton that you've you've chucked out there. I, that can, I, I think he would choose Ipswich Town. I think he loves that the adulation that he gets from supporters. He wants to feel loved. And I think he's got values in, in football that go beyond finance as well. Like last summer when he did eventually come here, there were there were options for him to go to Saudi Arabia. And, and clearly there's going to be financial incentives to go and play football in Saudi Arabia. But it doesn't come with the same sort of football the football buzz, the football, the football pyramid, it's, it's not there. And and I think he really values that. Um, so I can, I, I agree with Stu, lo, a loan back is exactly what I, exactly what I think will happen. And, um, and I, I, I would really hope he'd be here for another year. Does that cushion the blow as well a little bit financially? Because I assume if he's on loan, town won't be paying the whole whack of his wages, would they? Do we, do we know anything about that? Because clearly he's going to be on a, a big wage, whatever in League One, um, that would be a slightly cheaper option, I guess, would it? Yeah, I, I well, yeah, it would, it would it would be a cheaper option in that you're not committing up front to a three year contract on a certain wage, there's no. Mm. Um, but you know, he Ipswich pay good good money in in League One. I'm sure I'm sure they wouldn't be paying all of his loan fee, and he probably is a league a league um, a League A uh, contract is gonna have been worth more, but it, it, it's paid good wages in League One in League One terms. So um, I don't think he'd be a massive kind of outlier compared to everything else, but um, we shall see. It took a lot of work to get him here the first time. Um, I think there could well be a fair amount of work needed to be done to get him back the second time, but I feel sure that if that work is going to happen, it's already uh, already being discussed and worked on. So uh, mm. for me, for me, it's um, I'd love I'd love to see him back. But if he does come back, let let's get him back here with a better shirt number because uh, forty three is nonsense. What um, it, what number would you like to see him wear? He can have he can have that Scott Fraser's eleven shirt. He can have the number eleven back that he used to wear. Excellent. Um, and who knew? Stewie, you may you may have known this because you're a lot closer to Hutchie than I am. Speaks fluent French. Lovely. League. Uh, fantastic. Um, so you're both saying yes. I'm saying purely on the basis of finances. No, because I think they should be spending most of their money, if not all of their money, on a, a striker, the mythical 20 goal a season striker. Anyway, let's move on, boys. The two boys who This who also match- depends, oh. sorry to, to interject. I mean, we're assuming that Kieran McKenna here is going to play with the two number 10s next season and that's how he's going to play. He might not. They might. He might go with, with one in behind two strikers and, and maybe he's only been doing that because of the players that he's, he's got. There's a, there's a fairly big assumption that this is McKenna's style of play. Maybe he's just been playing to the uh, the attributes of his squad so far. That that would be very interesting. Mm-hmm. And if, if he decides that he wants to go down more of a striker-heavy route next season... Then there's a decision to be made there, of course, with Chaplin and Deluco set to be here already as it stands. So mm. something to consider. So the boys who matter, 
they're saying yes, and that the people who matter most, the Kawe Army, they're saying yes overwhelmingly, eighty-two percent. Let's move on, boys. Um, to the next one. I don't, I can't see there being a disagreement here. Dominic Thompson signed from Brentford, mostly been playing in that left wing back role. Has he done enough though for the town to consider trying to bring him back? The Kawe Army, they say no. They say of about 350 votes, 97% saying, not for me, at town. I'm going to start with you, Stewie, because I started with Hutchie last time. I don't think anyone has actually made any comment on Thompson at all, which kind of shows you the interest there. Dominic Thompson, is there any argument at all that he should be brought back to Portland Road? Um... Few, I don't think he's done enough to me to be saying, yes, we found the answer to our left-sided issue in in the loan spell that he's had so far. In his defence, he's come in sort of mid, mid-season with, with a lack of games and maybe is, you know, we haven't seen the best of him so far, but I don't know if I've seen enough there now to see that he can he can take the team to a new level next season but he's 21 he'd made his he played for Brentford in the Premier League earlier in the season had kept Sterling very quiet and an impressive display by all accounts you'd be buying him for potential and someone to develop not necessarily for someone that I think could be playing week in week out and and take it switch to a new level He's, he's had a decent run at it in the second half of this season and um haven't quite seen enough. I think they'll be they'll be looking for for an alternative. I, I would I would suggest. Okay, so Stewie's saying good riddance. Um, Hutchie, what are you saying? I'm saying, can you carry on talking amongst yourselves while I run and answer my door, please? Someone is absolutely smashing my door down. And, oh uh, my goodness! It's the yeah, police. I, I need to stop them. If I don't come back, it is the police. All right, carry on talking. <laughs> well then, let's let's continue this, then, Stewie. Dominic Thompson, you said that he's not done enough. Is there an argument he's been played out of position though? Because he's not really. You would say a, a wing back is he he's more of a, a left back so are we perhaps judging him harshly on being played out of position possibly and again it comes back to what what system that Ipswich want to play next season um I would assume I think McKenna is he's very much a back three man I don't think that's going to change so I think Ipswich do need to look for a different type of, of left-sided option so he's faded a little bit in games Dominic Thompson um there's no doubting his passion I mean, it's pretty clear that I think, like you said, what was the percentage of, of people in the poll? That on 90, Dominic Thompson? 97% saying 97 no. So the, the people have spoken there. One thing I would say is he's, he's certainly shown his passion. He got in that he got in that touchline scrape with, with Danny Cowley in the Portsmouth game. I don't know if you saw his reaction the other week when he got the, the headed assist in, I can't remember which game that was, but he... he, he uh, if you watch him, he celebrates like he scored the goal himself. I mean, he's playing with real passion for for a lone player. I think he's someone that's feeling like he's he's got a point to prove and has certainly been been living it here at Ipswich. But um, speaking ruthlessly from a, from a football point of view, I think Ipswich will. You know, how often we talked about the left sided problem all season at Ipswich Town? I think Andy and I worked out that it was something like six or seven different players that had either played left back or left wing back. For Ipswich this season, when you go through people like Kenlock, Clements, I think Kane Vincent Young played there one game. Um, Coulson, you know, that seems like a lifetime ago. So they've not found the answer to it. And I still don't think Thompson is the answer to it in short. So that that will be probably for me the top, the top priority this summer is sorting that out. That was tremendous filling and filibuster. Thank you. you. Like the professional you are. Hutchie's now back, so you've not been arrested for being a badass gangster, Hutchie. No, um, I've had some gu- I've had some stuff for the garden delivered, but she was oh. very passionate about making sure it was delivered right now. What are you getting for so, the garden? We're we, we looking at renovations? Um, no, just just um, some cosmetic stuff, a little trellis, uh, a ar- little archway. Um, yeah. Not, not a water feature? I, I cover no, it the for the garden. No. I think well, it's one of those things that's probably going to look better and uh, and kind of sounds better in your head than it probably yeah, does in reality. We are getting a pond. Oh. Uh, but not a wa- not like a water feature as as such. You're going to stock the pond? Um, we're going to Having... try and stock it naturally. Uh, 
so it attracts some wildlife naturally before when you say stock the pond does that mean buy fish absolutely it does yeah right okay just checking um no <laughs> <laughs> no no we're gonna hope hopefully wait for some newts to just turn up. oh mate you'll have newt. just just put in a, a a planning application to build something controversial you'll have newts rocking up no no problem um you get um, newts in there they always find newts um mate, so you'll have them we've had animals ro- last night right i was yeah sorry this is way no, it's fine. Like this it. is way away from dominic thompson's i was trying to go to bed last night i thought i was just about to go to bed and in comes the cat with a mouse and it's oh, just no. an absolute nightmare he's useless as well he carries them he doesn't kill them so he brought in this mouse just drops it and then it starts sprinting off around around the house um it's a, it's a gift isn't it isn't that why they do uh, it yeah it is it's a very kind very thoughtful gift but i don't i didn't need it to kind of go around the back of my daughter's kind of toy cabinet <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night and then run behind the sofa. And then I tried to kind of like help it out, like with a dustpan and brush, just yeah. like, come on, little mouse, just come in here. I'll take you to safety away from this predator. And it ran up to my dustpan and brush. I thought, yep, yeah, in it comes. And it jumped over the dustpan and brush over my shoulder and ran and ran somewhere else. I thought you were going to say it jumped right into Tiger's mouth. Oh, he was um, he- what to do with it but like, he expect when he brings it in mate he's expecting you just to pick it up and bite his head off that's what he thinks i did that he's last saying... <laughs> he's right an absolute joke sorry I lo- that's all right dominic I love thompson that. i love that digression ponds mice lovely um back to dominic thompson student saying as the rest of the ko army and we had a good chat saying no can you can you offer any contrary argument uh ultimately probably not um but I quite like him as a player. I, I, I think he, I think he's a good flat left back. Um, if, but I don't think they're going to play with a flat left back. I, I, I agree with Stu. I don't, I don't think we are necessarily like locked into seeing this system on the opening day of of twenty two twenty three season. But the the area I think will change will be the makeup of what is now a front three. Is it going to be a one behind a two or a two behind a one? I think the three. The three and then the four will stay, um, and if if that is the case, then a left sider, a left sider is is needed. I think because I think we're all we're all thinking that they they kind of need a a Wes Burns leveler for some for some balance because mm. it, Ipswich's attack has been a bit one dimensional and and you can see it coming down the right and they need to have that threat that threat down the left. Um, so if you're looking for a wing back, I think you go elsewhere to do- than Dominic Thompson, but, but I quite like him actually as a, as a left back, but mm. he, he, he's being asked to do more mm. than that right now. So um, it's probably, probably a no. So three no's, but being as you both brought it up in discussion, let's have this chat now before we move on to the last two the town need to definitely do something about the left hand side is the answer though, already in the building. We, we've spoken about Burns being a tremendous attacking force. There's a lad who not too long ago, we were all going, bloody hell, how the hell have Town got this guy in League One? Of course, I mean, Carl Edwards, who kind of faded away and, and finished the season injured. Could he not be the answer on, on the left-hand side? Imagine those two. Or is he just not what you'd expect, what you want in that in that wing-back slot? Oh, we don't, I don't know. Um, McKenna, McKenna's talked about Edwards potentially being a Wes Burns replacement on the on the right side. Is mm-hmm. it when he prior to his injury that was that was being discussed that they were working on that with him and, and probably it's probably his best route into the team. He, he's going to be a really interesting one um, for the summer because clearly clearly very talented and he's forgotten forgotten man right mm. now. But um, I don't see a reason why he couldn't play that role. He's got the work one. rate for it, hasn't he? Yeah, he certainly, he certainly gets back and does his off the off the ball work as as well as being a sort of a threat on it. I think he's played. We're used to him playing sort of wide left in the team, and him sort of cutting inside on his on his stronger right foot. I think I'm right in saying that. It's been such such a long time since we've seen seen Carl Edwards play, but um, it's certainly an option. A, another in house option that we we forget about is Kane Vincent Young, who I thought came back and had a, a really solid return to the team. And I think in terms of those dynamic qualities that Wes Burns has got, he's certainly got those, and he's someone that's played a lot of football. On the left-hand side, that that's where he played the majority of his football for Colchester before Ipswich signed him. So um, there's another option there. Matt, Matt Penny's obviously still un, under contract. Um, 
I guess maybe the only reason that you'd maybe try and get Dominic Thompson is if you decided to to sell Matt Penny. But I think he'll have at least another. Uh, what would he signed a two year contract last last summer, so he's got another year to go. I imagine you'd probably keep Matt Penny as the sort of the the backup squad option. It's easier to kind of let Thompson's loan expire and then and then go all out to try and sign a a starting left sider. It would would be my guess. Hmm. Um, okay. Let's move on. Just because I'm, I'm still thinking about gardens. Um, just a, just a final tip. If you're thinking about upgrading your garden, let me give you a tip. Solar lights. Invest in some quality solar lights. They make a big difference, and they look they look class, boys. We've had some built into our uh, our bedding, our, our sleepers we've got around the garden, and they look spot on of a summer's evening. You can also get some to hang on your fence. That kind of thing. Not too much money, but big return. Um, right then. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you. Yeah, in association with Gardener's World. Next week, Alan Titchmarsh will join us. Um, right then, two left to go, and I think these are probably the two that's going to be the most interesting debate. Number one, I'm going to leave a certain Mr. Bond till last, for obvious reasons. Number one, Tyreek Backinson. Ooh. Town have the option to sign him. That's already in print. Um, and the Kerry Army, they say yes. They say, let's take that option. 58%, the closest in terms of any of the votes, say sign him. Um, Fraser Barnard, however, says, I think we should be aiming for better quality than Backinson. I don't think he's good enough to be challenging Evans for a starting spot. Matete has walked into that Sunderland team and improved it. We need a couple of centre midfielders this summer. And Ian uh, Wallbank replies, I'd take him as the fourth choice and bring in a third choice as well to really push Evans and Morsey. Um, ben Prickett says, does Backinson do okay? Absolutely. Is he a championship midfielder? Absolutely not. That's why we need better. So I'm going to start with Hutchie because I started with Sue last time. Tyreek Backinson. We've spoken a lot on this pod about how initially underwhelmed you both were with him. But it seems to me that he's been getting better and better and growing into the role as he's been playing more, obviously, in, in Lee Evans' place. Where do you sit now on, on Tyreek Backinson? Literally. No, figuratively, not literally, obviously. Um, I think I sit with the fifty-eight percent. Yep. Uh, we had this, we had this chat a couple of weeks ago. I think um, he's really great. He has really grown on me, but I would I would have him. I'd, I'd I'd quite like him in the squad as one of a number of central midfielders. There's only there's a, clearly Sam Morsi is the standout, um, the standout one. I like Lee Evans as his partner. Um, I also. I've seen I've seen more from Backinson than than I saw from Raheem Harper, um, which I think if you sign Backinson full time, that's not a great that's not a great look for Harper. I don't mm. think, and I think that would probably lead to potentially potentially an exit or another loan or something there. But uh, just about, I would say I would say yes, but as part of a squad, and I would expect Evans to start the season ahead of. Of back incident, I'd also maybe expect you, you're talking about is Cameron Humphreys going to kind of join the party mm. in terms of midfield discussion? Are they could they sign somebody else as well? But Backinson's grown on me, and I think he, I think he, he's one that I think could make the jump. We so often see loan players who are brilliant on loan get signed permanently and don't continue that on. I think Backinson could be the opposite. I think. I think he's done okay in his loan spell, but I think he's one that, with a bit of love and McKenna's teeth, got into him over a preseason, and 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 him and Martin Pert working on him for for several weeks and months um, with a bit of love. I think they could they could help him realise the potential that he's clearly got as part of a squad. Is Tyreek Backinson a better player than Raheem Harper? It's hard. It's, it's hard to say, but from from what we've seen in an Ipswich shirt. I think Backinson's grown into a ro into the role that Harper wasn't able to grow into. Uh, but I think you have to be fair to Harper and remember what the situation was last summer that he was he was kind of in there in a role that didn't really suit him. Mm. He ended up being used by Cook as more of a number ten, but um, from the bench, I'd, I'd add. But uh, it's hard to say if he's a better player. But I think he's grown into a, something. It, it, in a more productive way than Harper was able to, but that's that's quite unfair to Harper, I think, given 
given the stage that he was at and when that all happened. Okay. So, Stewie, your your partner in crime is saying yes to Backinson. What are you saying? Similar caveat to Burst and Selena, really. I think, yes, as long as the price is reasonable, as long as it's not going to take away anything too much from, from the rest of your budget. Um, keep talking about him being quite raw and having potential. He is 23 years of age, so we're not talking about sort of 18, 19 here. Yes, young. Yes, someone that I think they, they could improve, but it will come down to what the what this option to buy cost is and it's which will then weigh that up and think what else does that money get you in the current market um and they'll look at it very objectively they'll punch the numbers into mark ashton's um supercomputer 23 years of age central midfielder someone who's got a bit of championship experience someone who's got a bit of height etc and, and they'll see what else comes out and if the, if they look at all of that and ultimately go there's not a lot else and I think you'd be signing him to be one of a central midfield unit that's still a bit of a project and he's right I mean he's cut I was probably his bit, biggest critic in those early days I wasn't having him at all in those first few games I thought he looked a bit languid I still think he looks a bit flaky for someone who's six foot three if you see one where well, the goal the other week that was the long throw into the box he just got uh, completely eased out from underneath the ball for, for, for quite a big lad so that's an area of his game that he needs to get better at. But certainly his understanding of that deeper midfield role in terms of intercepting the ball, breaking up the play and playing forwards. He always looks to play forwards um, first time. There's a lot there to work with, but we're talking about taking Ipswich to, to the next level. And is, mm. is he the answer to that? I don't know. And, and, and then again, so if we're talking about signing him as a third, fourth choice central midfielder, then we're coming on to the conversation about pathways and blocking pathways. And Andy's right, Cameron Humphreys, who, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of good things about. You've got to take that into account. Idris El Mazzouni, who we uh, we mustn't forget about as well. So um, I think that was it 58%, did you say, the, the vote? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a pretty good reflection of probably how people feel about him and how difficult a decision that's going to be be for the club to make this summer he's going somewhere this summer though isn't he because i i think it's pretty clear he's not he's not going back to bristol city and um if nigel pearson's still there anyway yeah, being part if. of that squad so yeah. that's um yeah that yeah i guess that's up in the air isn't it with with who's in charge there over the summer but um but yeah i think it's pretty clear that if nigel pearson is still the manager of bristol city Ty tyree backinson is going somewhere which i yeah. which i would hope would be the, the way that he left Bristol City, I would imagine, is reflected in what this deal, uh, sort of loan to buy deal, ultimately, ultimately was, because it's pretty clear that that City were quite, quite happy with him moving on elsewhere. But from what I've seen, um, from what I've seen, I, I quite, I quite like him. But um, I think we we both we both said there that there's, we're not signing him as the slam dunk partner for for Sam Morsi. That's for sure. That's my concern. You signing him as a backup, and then you you're automatically putting someone in front of your kind of signed already players. So like like you say, Cameron Humphreys, you just someone's only you've got Rakeem Harper to come back into the mix. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, on, on the Harper though, I mean, Harper's 22. So he's, he's a year younger than Backinson. If we've seen what McKenna has done with Backinson exactly. in, in a quite short space of time, mm. let's see what he can do with Rakeem Harper once he gets hold of him for a little bit as, as well. Um, Harper has serious pedigree, doesn't he? You're not telling me he's, He's just turned into a shite player overnight. Imagine someone, a coach with the ability of McKenna. I think he's got more dynamism than than mm. Tyreek Backinson in terms of his that box to box energy um, and athleticism, which is which are the buzzwords from McKenna in terms of recruitment. Um, so you certainly don't need both. Put it put it that way. And one one of them you've already got under contract and. Um, as I keep saying, there's for all the money it's which town have got, there's only a fight. You know, you've still got to juggle the numbers and, and decide which areas of your squad you put it into and do it. For years, it's felt like it's which have had a very bloated central midfield. They've had a lot of quantity and not enough quality. We've looked at, oh, they've got seven or eight central midfield options at various times when obviously Nolan was on the books and and various others. I think they need to 
they need to streamline that down a little bit and make sure they get the right ones rather than the multiple ones. So that, that comes into the, the back in some conversation. I don't want to lose the dream either because he's my favourite nickname of all the players, Rakeem the Dream. Um, Hutchie, just before, very quickly before we move on, Fraser there says, we need a couple of centre midfielders this summer. Given everything we've just discussed, would you agree? Um, uh, well, no. Uh, um, I think you need... Is that in addition to Backington, is he saying? Uh, where are we? I'll go back. Fraser says, no, no to Backington. Um, but we need a couple of centre midfielders. Okay, well, if, you, if you're not signing, I think you need to sign a central midfielder this <clears> summer. I'm not convinced you need to go out and get two. Uh, I'd t I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Um, how, many, you, how many do you want? Four? Yeah, you want. Four. Yeah, I, I think you want four or five, and one of them would be Humphreys. I would imagine if if you're going to go five, one of them's. Mm. Well, so if we're saying Morsi, Evans, Humphreys. If you're not keeping Backinson, yes, I think you sign one. If if you do, you've got El Mazzuni in there as well. This is where we're talking about having too many. So if you are yeah. signing one, are you, are you looking to sign one to potentially Sam Morsi? You'd imagine is nailed on, but are you looking to sign one potentially to start alongside Morsi and replace? I'm Evans? happy. I'm happy with Evans. If I'm yeah. if I'm honest at this point, I'm I'm happy with a fit Lee Evans with with backups beyond beyond that. Um, okay. I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, I, think you I know what you mean. To... You're going out to sign a slam dunk starter in central midfield. If mm. you're doing that, they've got to be... Well, Morsi's starting, so they've got to be head and shoulders above Lee Evans. That That's not going to come... That's not going to come cheap. Now, again, you've got to decide where you want to put your money. And I would say this top end of the pitch and that left side are, are far bigger priorities than, than central midfield. Yeah, right then. Perfect segue then to the big one. And it's the big one in terms of what he means to the, the hearts and minds of Ipswich Town. He's one of our own. Started the season like his shorts were on fire um, in double figures from God knows when. Who would have thought back then that we'd have been sitting here on April the 28th saying McCauley Bond is still town's leading scorer, but he's only got 12 goals. Incredible. And who would have thought this would even be a debate back then, whether or not town should try and sign him? And who would have thought that when we put this poll out, the answer from the KOA Army would be overwhelmingly no. 82% of the KOA Army saying, send Macaulay Bond back. That's from about 450 votes. So a, a decent sample size. Um, I'll just I'll just highlight some thoughts from the KOA Army. Chris Bennett says, sign Bond. I'm desperate for him to be part of any success the club has. He'll slot the winner in the pizza trophy at Wembley for us. Give him that moment. Um, a lot of people saying the only one they keep really is Selena. I'll see if there's any more. Any more Bond ones? I don't think there is. Um, Steve Lewis just saying, if we splash heavily on, on one player, it would have to be a 25-goal striker, that mythical 20-25-goal striker. Macaulay Bond, then. Um, I'm going to start with you, Stu. Clearly, there's a there's a wonderful narrative around Macaulay Bond. He's, he bleeds blue and white. He's a, he's a fan of the club. He's, he's this, he's that. He, it means more to him, all that kind of stuff. Um, but is he... Good enough? Does he does he demand enough of a what I'd imagine again would be a a decent wage to be part of that? Let's be honest, underperforming striking unit. Can he can he do better? Can he be the man who can be part of that up, upgraded striking unit next season? It's hard, isn't it? Because everything, every conversation surrounding Macaulay Bon is coloured by his backstory and what. Ipswich Town means to him and what we all mm. got so swept away with um, at the start of the season. He's looked a little bit a little bit lost and frustrated increasingly as time's gone on. I think this sort of goalless run has, has got into his head a little bit. He, he's had things going on off the pitch as well. By all accounts, which we, we always have to take into account. I think I said ages ago when we were talking about sort of who should be starting and things. It, it felt like sometimes players deserve, when they've given so much of themselves to the club and the fan base over a prolonged period, do they then deserve to get that back during their sort of hour of need? And that's kind of how I feel a little bit about Macaulay Bond. And I think maybe from a, a ruthless business point of view, maybe there's an opportunity for Ipswich to get him at a, a knockdown price now, both in terms of, the fee 
and probably the wage that that he'd be able to command at this stage. Um, I don't know how Macaulay feels about this as well. I think everyone sort of takes it for granted that he would come back here in, in a heartbeat, but mm. it's a short football career, Macaulay Bon, and he's had to work really hard to kind of, he dropped right down into non-league and has had to work hard to get himself back to the championship, or has had a taste of playing at second tier level. Um, maybe he's, maybe, I don't know where his head's at at the moment with it all as, as well, but it does feel ultimately and as that poll reflects that that it's coming towards its end at the moment because ultimately Kieran McKenna will want to every manager wants to sign their own talisman their own star striker and and it and it doesn't feel like Ipswich have theirs in the building at the moment does it mm. so you're saying no then Stu to Bond, just to be I think ultimately again with the caveat of if you could get it if you could get it at a reasonable fee you could, you're still going to want what at least three strikers. If we're going to say Ipswich are playing with one central striker, let's let's work on that basis. Jackson, I think, is looking like he's going to be one of them. Mm -hmm. You're going to go all out to sign a your talisman striker that's going to be your starter every week. How easy is it to then go and persuade someone else? Depending on the time frame of things, you're going to come in, but you're going to be vying with. X, who quite clearly we've signed to be our main man, that then becomes a difficult conversation. I'm not we've not mentioned Piggott in the mix here as well, who's still under contract that could be. So I don't know. I don't know if Macaulay Bond would would want to stay on the basis that he's going to be in and out the team once every few months or whatnot and playing off the bench. Who knows? I, I, ultimately, Mark, I'm probably saying no. I, I felt like I've put that that off as long as I can, but um, it saddens me to say it, but. Yeah, I, I think it's probably time for Ipswich to look look at somewhere else. You could argue, of course, that Bond maybe. Oh no, it's different coming in on loan. But he, he came in on paper as the number two behind Piggott. Piggott, you'd think at the start of last season, we all thought Piggott would be the guy who was the the talisman, the guy who's going to fire all the goals. And of course, that changed pretty quickly with with Bond start to the season. Um, and now neither of them have done it. So Hutchie, what are you saying? Stewie's saying no, just about after a long and winding route to it. So Sorry. That's all right. It's fine. Um, Hutchie, what, what, would you, what are you saying? No, I'd, I'd, I'd take the same route with the same stops and probably end up at the same the same result. Um, we've talked about Macaulay Bon a lot over the last five or six months. And I would, yes, if he was if he was someone you could have as one of three strikers happily in that role, yeah. But I think there's too much, there's too many moving parts for that to be possible in too many ways. I think mm. they'll, as Stu said, I think they're guaranteed to sign their main man, whoever that may be. And I think they will sign another another striker and it'll be the main man, A another, and and Jackson as the three. I think Pickett is someone I'd be looking to to move on at this point. Um I don't think he fits what McKenna wants. And in, in many ways I'm not convinced that Bond does either. Um he's always offside. Which, which which is infuriating, um, but I think there the spark seems to have gone, uh, and yes, there there are things in his personal life that have been really really tough to deal with. But the the kind of the you always used to bank on Macaulay Bond just incredible work rate, and you can he's he's not it's not that he's not trying, but it just doesn't seem that there's the the, the spark there mm. now. It something that was so wonderful seems to have has has fizzled has fizzled out and I think trying to reignite that spark again might be might be tough in the scenario that we're talking about here is as him being kind of one of one of three and not of as the main man. So I think ultimately ultimately I'd land on a no, but I would always uh I'll always try and remember Macaulay's lone year as being what it was at the start because that was really special. It it, it felt so special at the time. It's just so disappointing that it didn't it didn't endure to uh, to this point. It was lightning in a bottle, wasn't it? Back then, it was it was tremendous. Stewie, when when uh, Hutchie said there that you're not sure Bond brings what McKenna wants from his his striker, you kind of nodded in agreement. You you don't think Bond is is, is a fit for what McKenna wants? No, I, well, the fact that Jackson ended up being the guy that was kind of taking his chance as the central striker says to me that he he wants a bit more 
a bit more pace, a bit more athleticism. That's not to say that Norwood and Bon are, aren't capable of that. I just think both of them are quite off the cuff, erratic. You know, they got labelled the Bash Brothers by by McKenna. Is that almost kind of faint praise a little bit? I, d I don't know. I think he wants someone that can sort of run channels and create space and um, be a little bit more tactically minded on the football pitch instead of just going out and just trying to sort of rough up centre halves and kind of make things happen through sort of chaos rather than um, sort of a, a, a clear action plan sort of thing. So it just doesn't, it doesn't, the fact that he's rotated those forwards so often speaks mm. volumes and the fact that Macaulay Bond was introduced, what, in the 90th minute last weekend, it, it's pretty clear it's heading a certain way. If he had any thought in his, and we're debating this now, whether he should or shouldn't, it's pretty clear to me that McKenna's made up his mind that, you know, Bond's lack of game time for a prolonged period mm. says to me that, that this is heading a, a certain way now. Agreed. I think, I think McCauley's going to leave, unfortunately. I'm, just to be contrary, I'm going to say keep him because I'm a hopeless romantic. I love the, the narrative around McCauley Bond, the fact that he's one of our own growing up uh, on the Chantry estate or Chantry estate, as you, you, uh, you posh people say. Um, I love the narrative with Fabio Wardley. I can do more with that going forward, boys. So let's think of me and that storyline. Um, so yeah, let's keep more. Let's keep McCordy Bon, um, and hopefully he gets a, he gets the goal at Fires Town to promotion. Maybe it was all, all part of the master plan to sort of make make sure he depreciates as an asset from yeah. from which in the last few months McKenna's come in, seen in the early days. Yeah, I can work with him. I like yeah. him. Now we'll we'll, keep, we'll just let him sit on the sidelines and we'll we'll wait till we can get him at the, the cheapest price. I like it. I don't think that's really the case. No. Okay. All right. There you go. Then here endeth chat about loan players. I hope you enjoyed that, friends. Um, and I want to do a mini mailbag because we've had a couple of people slide into the old DMs. Um, and it's important that when people take the time to write to us, we, we do respond and use the questions. One of them particularly relates to this whole end of season contracts loans thing. So I'm going to put this to both of you. This is from Anthony Biondi. Biondi? Biondi. I like it. Hi, Kings. I have a question for the next show that I don't believe I've heard discussed yet. You've discussed our summer activity, both ins and outs, but what about who we may have to sell? In particular, players like Wolfie. Does a championship club come in for him? And if so, with the backing we have now, what's our price? I'd love to know your thoughts if possible. Thanks for the content. Love the podcast. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for listening. Hutchie, we, we haven't really spoken about players who may be on other clubs' radars in this summer. Town have not gone up. They do have some really good players. So are we going to see some clubs from the, the the leagues above, shall we say, targeting some of Town's top tier players? Is that any concern for you? Are there players you think may move on, may get sold? I think you I think you might see some clubs from tiers above targeting Ipswich's players, but I think Ipswich are in a position where they don't they're not going to need to sell anybody. So if they if they do sell, it will be because they're happy to sell and because mm. somebody's reached the the price that that kind of tips tips them over the edge. Um, player trading is something that that Mark Ashton's been very big on in the past and has in 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 many ways has been able to be quite successful at. But I'm sure he will know that all of these assets are much will be much greater. Luke Wolf, let's use Luke Wolfenden as an example. Luke Wolfenden, argument's sake might be worth a couple of million pounds this summer. If you try and sell Luke Wolfenden as an as a championship football player, very, very different in terms of in terms of the fee that you can ask. So I would be I'd be very surprised actually if if this summer anybody any of the prized assets are sold because I don't think they need to. I don't think there's the pressure there to do it. But if they are, it's because a really, really top offers come in and um and it and it and it all adds up financially. But my gut feeling is that's not going to happen this year. You'd take a, a bonkers offer, would it? To use Mick McCarthy's favourite phrase, a bonkers offer uh, may prize a player away. Stewie, what, what do you think? And who, who would you say that are Town's top saleable assets in terms of other teams looking at them going, want a bit of that? I think Wolfenden's probably the only one, to be honest, that I could mm -hmm. see someone coming in and testing the waters with. At the moment, Ipswich have got some some good assets. I think George Edmondson is someone that can go on to, to bigger and better things from what we've seen of him so far in an Ipswich shirt. He's ended the season injured. 
He's only been here a year, so I can't see anything happening there on that front. Wolfenden is the only one. He's someone that clubs higher up the food chain will have been aware of for quite some time, you know, going back to when Sheffield United were being linked with him. Um, and Paul Lambert said, we got the, we had the flake comment around that time, didn't we? What, what was it again? Remind me, Andy. Uh, three billion pounds won't even get you a flake mm. these days. It will. I mean, they are they are more expensive, cost of living, and all that. But you could definitely get a flake for three million. Yeah. Absolutely, loads of flakes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the way we're heading. I think at the moment with the price yeah. of electric and gas and everything, but we're not quite there yet. But if people were talking about three million pounds for Luke Wolfenden, then. Um, that gives you an idea of, of where he's at. But clubs, we forget what transfer fees are in League One and what the record fees have been for players. Ultimately, Andy's right. It's a different ball game now. The game has changed. To use the the, the well-used pun under, under the new ownership, Ipswich don't need to sell. They're not in a position. And Luke Wolfenden will be a, worth a hell of a lot more to them if they can get into the championship and if he can continue his, his progress. So... Um, there may be one or two that put in a, a cheeky little inquiry about Luke Wolfenden, but I would imagine they would get fairly short shrift on, on that front. Okay, thanks for your question, Anthony. There you go. The, the ones that will leave will be the ones that will be on Ipswich's terms. Someone like Hladke, who will want to, hasn't happened for him, will want to go away and play first-team football. It was I don't know how telling it was that he wasn't on the bench last weekend. We'll have to find out why that was when we speak to Kieran McKenna tomorrow. But if that's through choice, that, that might be that he's looking to move on. We've, we've talked about Piggott. We've talked about the Tyree Simpson situation in quite a lot of detail. Someone like a Matt Penny, who will now be coming into the last year of his thing, but that they will be players that are leaving on Ipswich's terms rather than sort of vultures circling and, and prizing anyone away. I, I can't really see, see anyone else in that bracket. Fair enough. Thank you, Anthony. There you go. The boys have answered your question. I hope you uh, enjoyed that. And just finally, I know I know how both of you are going to answer this, but um, a lad called Sammy has taken the time to DM us. So I thought it was important we answer this question. He says, hi, my name's Sammy. I'm 13 and me and my dad listen to your podcast every week. We love them. Anyway, I've got a question for Mailbag. Would you rather go up by playoffs or by automatic promotion? I think we have talked about this before. So I've got an inkling of how you both are going to respond to this hopefully this is an issue for next season Stewie when town do go up next season how would you rather them go up storming the league automatic promotion style or by sudden death the brawl for all the game at Wembley by the playoffs how would you like how would you how would you rather like it I'm probably going to answer differently to how I've answered in the past because the correct okay. answer is the best way is Wembley Wembley glory and you get that big day out with all of the fans and everything Right now, give me the title. Give me automatic promotion. Make it such a winning machine. Get that because if they go up automatically, it means they've got a far better chance of hmm. doing well in the championship again, which is the next hurdle. Whenever that comes, that Ipswich Town would have to cross. So, right now, given that given that Ipswich have finished eleventh, ninth, and more than likely are going to finish eleventh again after Saturday's game, I don't want to mess about with the playoffs. Just, just. Just win, win the league, and I think winning the league would bring its own sort of party and everything that would go with it as as well. So, um, I think in the past I've probably answered, "Give me Wembley any day of the week." That's the best way to go up, but I've probably changed that a little bit now with the growing frustrations over the years. Hutchie, you were not far off um, Sammy's age when you were at Wembley, and Town went up through those playoffs. Um, how, how how would you rather Town go up next season? <laughs> uh, Anything but second, yeah. Don't need don't need to finish second. That's um, that doesn't need to happen. But um, no, I'd still go playoffs. It, I think it's us. <laughs> I'll I'll well, take a second. Well, it's just I don't mean I don't mean anything but second uh, if they're getting mean. promoted. Yeah. Um, but no, I'd I think I I would still take the playoffs because I think it gives you it gives it gives you those. The, the, that big playoff semi-final game at Portman Road mm. and it gives you the final which is the like, in the fullness of time give me the playoffs because those those memories will be will be great but to celebrate with a trophy on the pitch at Portman Road would be great I've never seen that um, so to, to win a league and be presented with a league title on the pitch in front of a full 
Portman Road would be pretty cool. But um, so in the short term, win the league, but long term for sort of looking back and the memories, you want that big explosion of blue inside Wembley and a, and a, and a playoff semi final that you can always look back on. So I'd, I'd still stick with the with, with the playoffs. Um, it's right an interesting now. one, isn't it? Because do the I don't know do the memories of winning multiple games over a season to go up as champions do those combined good memories outweigh the one off what ultimately is quite a nervy old day mm. you know if you get to a player final and i think obviously the memories associated with 2000 are not just of that day but they're of a culmination of about five years of kind of building mm. towards that aren't they and that's what kind of the release of everything that day um you speak to a Sunderland fan about playoffs right now. I think um, they would feel a little bit differently after sort of multiple heartaches. Maybe they're about to get their kind of Ipswich 2000 moment after several near misses along the way. But it's, it's an interesting debate. But ultimately, we'll, we'll take it whichever way it comes. <laughs> 100%. Let's hope it's next season. Sammy, thank you for listening. Thanks for your question. If you do want to see what town going up to the playoffs was like, go and watch Andy Warren's excellent film on YouTube, Wembley 2000. Um, a great bit of work. Should have been award winning uh, long before you were on this planet, Sammy. But what a day that was. So go back and watch that if you've not. I'm sure your dad will, will have stories about that as well. So maybe watch that together. Yes, Hutchie? On the subject of award win winning, can mm. I just bring you bring you some breaking news? We've mm. we've mi we've missed out on another award. I oh, I knew that. Yeah, did you? Yeah, we lost again, didn't we, to the the golf yeah. podcast second bunkered. year in a row. Bunkered. What what can be so good about bunkered? Um, well, I think without getting too controversial, um, the the team that produced that said podcast also put together the awards. So. Oh, um, <laughs> do they really? Know, without getting too controversial, there, I'm just leave, I'll just leave that hanging out there. Um, but it's nice to be nominated, isn't it, boys? Another it's really nice, a third national award nomination for the for the KOA. Um, so you're so saying you're going public now and saying that that is a fix? Is that what you're uh, saying? Well, you know, allegedly, um, okay. lots of allegedly sprinkled in there, but absolute farce. Clearly, we deserve to win that. And we should have won that. We should have won multiple awards by now. Um, well done, we'll Bunkered. Hope exactly. you enjoy it. We'll, we'll see on, you. On the announcement, they haven't even put a capital B on Bunkered. That's that's how slack this podcast this podcast is. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, we'll, we'll win an award. Awards, anyway. We'll win an award one day. Um, thanks for your questions, chaps. Let's move on now to, to wrap up the show. Um, couple of things just to remind you about. I've already mentioned Koei Retros, the 61-62 stuff that Rossi's done. He's also doing a 91-92. Tracks of Girls Talk as well. Look out for that. And the fan social this evening, which should be on your feed tomorrow morning, Friday. Stewie, um, you've done a piece with Gary Probert. We talked about the countless people that town now have behind the scenes, the structure that, uh, that Paul Lambert often referred to being wrong. There's certainly a structure there now. And Gary Probert's a big part of that structure. Do you want to just ch chat a little bit about that? Part one went on at 6 a.m. this morning. Part two will be live tomorrow morning. Um, sorry, 6 a.m. Wednesday went on live the first bit, didn't it? Part two, definitely tomorrow morning. Tell us all about Gary. Yeah, Gary is director of football operations. He's someone that's followed Mark Ashton across from Bristol City. Uh, so I had a really uh, interesting hour-long discussion with him recently, both about his journey to this point, which is part one of that interview that you can you can read now that you've mentioned and also about his role at Ipswich and uh, what he'll be looking to achieve and, and exactly what, what his kind of wi wide-ranging responsibilities will be in this job. He's, he's effectively, I guess, the new Leo Nil, really, with, with Lee leaving in the summer. He's, his job is to kind of pull a lot of all of this together. So it's about making sure, uh, I talked to him in part two about some of Kieran Dyer's comments when he left the club about sort of pathways not being there and and that is going to be a big part of Gary's job. So he's doing everything from sort of overseeing uh, academy pathways towards the first team to keeping an eye on the lone players who, who are out to going out and doing a bit of scouting himself. So he's had a really interesting uh, journey to this point from sort of uh, making cheap cheese sandwiches for the Forest Green under 16s to developing what, £40 million pounds worth of, of players that Bristol City sold, homegrown players over the course of a couple of uh, summer transfer windows to now being one of the main men at Portman Road. So um, 
yeah, hopefully people uh, will, will read that, find out a bit more about a key player behind the scenes and, and fingers crossed we can bring you a few more of those type of articles over the summer. Yeah, go and check that out. That's a, that's a Watson special, something that Stewie thrives on and excels at. Um, we should also mention before we start talking about Charlton, the final game of the season, which is going to be a brief chat, friends. Um, Ipswich Town won a cup last night, Stewie. They lifted a cup. Tell us all about it. They lifted it in style. It was Adam Ate's under-18s were League Cup champions and they demolished Coventry City 7-0 at Portman Road in a crowd of, in front of a crowd of about 500-odd. Kieran McKenna in attendance as well to watch them. This is the, uh, the under-18s group that made it all the way to the semi-finals of the Youth Cup last year before their um, valiant efforts against Liverpool in the semi-finals. Um, Coventry went down to 10 men, I think, in the 13th minute. Tawanda Chirewa, one of those youngsters on the bench last weekend with a Penenka penalty oh. to put Ipswich Town 1-0 up. Ipswich got a penalty not long after that. He had that one saved, Chirewa. I'm not sure if he went for the Penenka again on that occasion. He wasn't there at the game last night, but uh, the rebound was was tucked away and Ipswich romped to a 7-0 win. Um, so there's a few players in that group to, to keep an eye on. Uh, Chirewa mentioned he's been a goal machine, uh, number 10 for them this season. Cameron Humphreys, who spoke really well, have a look for his video interview that the club did afterwards. Looks like an impressive young man off the pitch as well as on it. And then some of the even younger ones, people like Jack Manley, Nico Valentine, who have been spoken about for, for quite some time. So exciting times for some of the youngsters coming through. The under-23s have got a chance of finishing in, in the playoffs again this season so um yeah great great to see an Ipswich Town team um winning some silverware mm, and that's the perfect segue from those players Ch uh, Chiwa how do you say it Chirewa Chirewa um and Humphreys into this game this weekend the final game of the season Charlton at home not what we hoped it would be um but potentially a chance to see some of these talented young players that town have there were a few of them on the bench last week actually how do we feel about this final game this season it's going to be a tremendous crowd at portman road twenty four thousand plus for a, a game that means absolutely nothing against a side that are toiling in the in the lower reaches of league one um how are you feeling about it what do you want to see how can we sex this up if charlton are toiling um ipswich aren't very far ahead of them oh of course so, charlton uh, are 12th, 12th now, aren't they? <laughs> so yeah um, yeah. yeah, not a great, not a great look for for either for either team. They're only one place ahead of uh, ahead of Charlton. So, um, mm. what do we want to see? Well, we obviously the the young players were on the bench at um, at Crew the other day. I'm sure they will be around it again. Um, McKenna will have wanted to put more of them on the pitch, um, and I imagine a couple of them will will get onto the pitch in in this one. I I, I wouldn't think they'd start, but I think they would have roles to play from the from the bench maybe so hopefully it's a, a nice sunny day uh and a nice just a nice way to send everybody off um into the summer with a win and you never know they might even get 10th if uh if bolton Ooh. don't do the business against fleetwood so what that's how we about that's how we sex it up saying there's nothing on the game chance to clinch 10th spot bloody hell um stewie you'll be there We'll all be there, yeah. actually. I'll be there um, for the Battle of Tenth. Um, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be there too. Um, I'll have my transistor radio earpiece in to see how Bolton, <laughs> Bolton, uh, Bolton. Oh, they're still, they're, they're behind against awesome. Fleetwood. Ipswich are up to Tenth. Um, you'll hear the little murmur around the crowd. Um, As it stands. Um <sighs> Obviously, there, there is a potential for friends, <laughs> friends reunited as well, isn't there? Mr. Mr. Scott Fraser. I think he's injured. Oh, is he's he? Not played for a little while. I don't yeah. think uh, he wasn't fit to play last time out. So we're robbed of that. Can't even sell it on that. That subplot as well. Um, Charlton have been going okay, actually. Having a look at their... I think they've won six of their last nine. They've beaten Shrewsbury, Cambridge and Rotherham recently. All teams that Ipswich have failed to beat in recent times. They've had a real up and down season under, under Johnny Jackson. But... Sometimes these end of season games can, in the sunshine, it's kind of a bit like end of term. Everyone, sometimes they can make not very good football matches like last weekend at Crew, with the conditions didn't help. Sometimes it can just, both teams just go out and enjoy themselves and play football and it can make a, 
an entertaining affair. Let's hope it's more Wigan than it is Crew in terms of a, a performance and a, and a spectacle. Ipswich's home form's been pretty good at Portman Road, certainly since McKenna's taken over. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed. They, they send us all off into the summer with a, a bit more of a spring in our step. I kind of remember the, the Leeds game after relegation where they beat them, is it 3-2 on the fin final day? Yeah. Something like that that just sends us away with a, with a little bit of a smile because it was just... Uh, Last few weeks have just brought us just a little bit down to earth, haven't they? How is it for you, boys, Hutchie? You you travelled the length and breadth of the country once again, following Ipswich Town. Um, we hoped this season was going to be so much more than it's turned out to be. At least on the pitch, it's been a tremendous season uh, in terms of other things to to report on. It's been incredible, really. Um, final game of the season, you just think, hmm, nice bit of time off. Well, not time off, but. No, no working every weekend for a few a few months or a few weeks. Do you kind of feel the need to decompress after the final game um, of the season? Not for very long. I start to miss football matches again after maybe three weeks. Yeah, yeah, I miss it. I like I like watching football. Um, yes, it feels weird the season being over in April. Mm. I that doesn't even made it to May. Um, but yeah, it's an early an early start for next season. So. Um, yeah, we won't be without it too long. July the 30th, boys, football kicks off next season. Um, Stewie, how, how do you feel? You're a veteran of multiple Ipswich Town failed campaigns. <laughs> You've you sat in this this final game of the season loads of times with nothing on it. Um, how is it for you? Kind of, I think I used the, the phrase, it's been sort of fun and frustrating in equal measure this season. I don't know how I'll kind of look back on it in, in the fullness of time, I guess. In years to come, we'll look back on it as the season that Kieran McKenna took charge is ultimately how it will be remembered. But from demolition man all the way through to now, it's certainly been been a soap proper. It's not it's not left us short of uh, things to to write and talk about, has it? Um, but ultimately, they're going to finish tenth or eleventh, which is just not good enough. Mm. Uh, you know, I said this in the last pod that it's let's not sort of fall into this trap of everything is fluffy clouds and rainbows just yet there's uh that that record across three seasons in league one now is to not make the playoffs three times in a row is is unacceptable and there, there's no excuses next year i'm not saying i know it's a tough division i know it's probably going to get even even harder and i've never been one that's been like sort of turning my nose up at, at league one football it's you've got to work damn hard to get out of it but to finish in the top quarter of the division, which is ultimately mm. what we're asking Ipswich to do, that should be happening with the resources now, with the fan base, with everything that this club's got going for it. And um, there'll be no excuses next year. So um, ready ready for a break. Always am at this stage of the season. But like like Andy, the, uh, the, the football itch will, will soon need a scratch. Mm. Okay. Well, as I say, we are all going to be there. I'm still waiting confirmation that I can join the end of season lap of honour with the players, boys. Um, I assume that'll be okay. The battle for 10th will be there. So if you do see us, come and say hello. Um, always nice to meet people. Roscoe will be on the uh, on the ales, having a few scoops with the KOA fan social like, after the game. So look out the pubs around Ipswich. Um, you may see them and obviously go and say hello to them as well because who knows what sort of state they will in. Um, right then, boys, it's been a long one today. I've enjoyed it, though. We've talked about um, Prince Charles, Sir Alf Ramsey, garden maintenance, cats killing mice, and Ipswich Town battling for 10th spot in League One. Um, anything else to mention, boys, before we take our leave? No other business. No other business. Excellent. I hope you enjoyed it today. Just a reminder to support our sponsor, uh, Manscaped, use the code KOA manscaped.com for 20% off and free delivery and also support us across all our social medias kings of anger especially on youtube because we're really trying to grow that at the moment twitter instagram and facebook and leave us a five-star review on itunes because it helps other people discover us um, have a great weekend if you are going enjoy the game if not join us back here next week where we'll have to i'm afraid friends review the season we'll try and make it entertaining we we'll look back at everything we predicted particularly me at the start of the season and see how wrong i was not for the first time so we will convene again then. Have a great weekend and speak to you soon.